Hello and welcome back to the second part of Module 5. This is Module 5B on drug use. And here I wish to look at the two ideas that are associated with uh, drug use, which is the harm that it causes to users, but also the pushback in terms of the legal aspects, the notion, or at least the, the moral and ethical uh, injustice of drug prohibition. So <clears throat> we'll look at these two ideas in a bit more detail, and we'll start with uh, a question that uh, Michael Humer presents to us. Should the recreational use of drugs such as marijuana, cocaine, heroin, LSD be prohib pro prohibited by law? So that's the question. Should these, these uh, uses of drugs be prohibited? So the prohibitionists say yes, primarily because drug use is extremely harmful both to the drug user and to society at large. The legalist or the individual that is concerned with a moral and ethical dimension of such laws says no because some drugs are sometimes beneficial. We know that uh, cocaine in the early 1900s was used as medicine. In the 1970s, uh, 60s and 70s, uh, MDMA or ecstasy was uh, prescribed by psych psychologists. And we know that uh, medical marijuana even today is still being used for a wider array of, uh, of ailments, uh, PTSD or lack of appetite, uh, these kinds of things indicate to us pretty clearly that uh, drugs have some positive benefits and we need to we need to consider these things. And more important is the fact that <clears throat> drug prohibition violates our our human rights, right? Our freedom to choose. So those are essentially the ideas that I would like you to think about as we go through this material. Now, we need to always get our facts right. And with drug use come different different terms that are associated with that field. So there is, for example, drug legalization. So to legalize drugs would mean to that there would be no criminal offenses for the creation or manufacturing and sale of drugs to adults. So that's one. Drug decriminalization means the removal of penalties, criminal penalties for the use of the drugs, not necessarily the manufacturing and the sale, but the use of the drugs. So there we have a distinction already between legalization and decriminalization. Uh, here, for example, uh, this is a website. If you are wondering in Canada what is going on, um, if you click on it, it will take you right to it. There we go. What you need to know about cannabis, and this is a Government of Canada website. So it is certainly well worth having a look. But we won't do that just right now. Please do have a look at it. Let me reframe here for a moment. Okay, so along with legalization and decriminalization, we have uh, drug prohibition as well. So it is possible for someone that is against drugs to make them that distinction as well. Say, look, the manufacturing and sale, sale of drugs uh, should be made illegal, but decriminalize the use of it uh, up to certain amounts, for example. That's, that's what we had had for a period of time in Canada, and eventually the sale and use of drugs is now legal, right? It's been decriminalized. Now, the jury's still out on the manufacturing of it because if you are doing it illegally, uh, the government is not getting not getting their cut, we'll say, because there is, are no safety features in, in place. You could have a warehouse full of drugs and, dr and pot plants that are growing, and there is no sort of legal recourse as to whether or not that place is safe whether it's uh, being mandated for, from someone that the government knows it, of its existence and has, has uh, allowed it to, to occur. The manufacturing of drugs is kind of a bit of a gray area still presently, but we should at least reserve the right to make those distinctions between legalization and decriminalization. So when we talk about drug prohibition, there is always that possibility. So let's take a look at uh, the argument that prohibitionists make. And it is fairly simple and straightforward, and we'll take a look at it. It starts this way. Drug use is very harmful to users. Makes sense. Therefore, the government should prohibit people from doing things that harm themselves. There's where the government intervention comes in. Therefore, the government should prohibit drug use. So if A and B are correct, then it should follow with C. So does that sound reasonable? 
So let's take a look at uh, each one of these components and see whether the, the argument is logically sound. Well, it turns out that the second clause is where we find the most problematic aspect of the argument. And in fact, it's not really a good enough clause, a good enough reason to prohibit the use of drugs. Okay, why is that so? If we were to look at the nature of the argument and how it's structured, we would say, look, it's not good enough because it's unqualified. Because we can think of many other things that people do that are completely legal. Smoking, drinking, riding motorcycles, uh, extreme sports, unsafe sex, all kinds of things that people do that also put their life in danger uh, and sometimes may even put others in harm's way. So it's a very, it's a very broad definition of what constitutes harmful behavior. That's really what it boils down to. That's what we mean when we say it's unqualified. So we can talk about other things which are absolutely legal and people can go ahead and do it without any legal repercussions, but they still fall under the same category of harm to the person. So uh, prohibitionists could argue that the government should only prohibit some activities. Then how do you make that distinction, right? Uh, how is drug use different from any other unsafe or unhealthy practice? Where do you draw the line? If the second clause is not a good one because it is unqualified, it doesn't state specifically that the, only this kind of harmful behavior should be illegal. We can look at it and say, well, look, who gets to call the shots? It's the government, obviously. They, they are going to set the agenda. So let's look, a, look at some different examples that would uh, perhaps make that second clause more problematic. Okay, first one is neither the harm to drug users nor the harm to others argument justifies prohibition because it is not the government's business to apply criminal sanctions to to prevent, right, to stop this kind of harm that we're, that we're talking about. Harm to drug users, in other words, harm to the person performing the task, smoking, drinking, extreme sports, whatever, um, as, a, as opposed to harm to others. Because guess what? It's also unqualified because we can think of other things that are either harmful to the person and also harmful to others. So that's the first one, and we'll look at that in more detail. The second one is that drug use is, is considered more harmful than other activities. Well, if you are a believer in science and statistics, and I know statistics can be said to or made to say different things, let's look at the stats as they presently are. So the idea that drug use is more harmful is uh, nonsensical when we consider the data. So in 2000, illegal drug use caused 17,000 deaths. Tobacco, 435,000. And obesity, 112,000. So here we have smoking causing almost a half a million deaths. Obesity, eating fatty foods and not dieting and exercising, 112,000 deaths in 2000. So the notion that drug use is more dangerous kind of doesn't fit what we know in terms of the statistics. For example, up here, alcohol, right? Harm to others, harm to user. Harm to others, alcohol, seems to be even much more. Out of, out of 80, it's about 45%. So that's a roughly, say, 30 to 35% uh, harm to the user. In other words, drinking alcohol and then getting behind the wheel of a car, for example, right, and driving home drunk, you're more likely to harm others than you are to harm yourself. Um, it takes the second step, and it's considerably less to get to uh, drugs such as heroin, where again, harm to the user seems to be a lot more than harm to others. And all the, all the way down. So we can see uh, tobacco is really not that far uh, down the list. Uh, then we keep on going. And the rest of it is certainly uh, drugs that are used by other people, anabolic steroids, uh, mushrooms, minimal. So we can see at the very top, this is what matters. Alcohol, which is a drug used by many, many people. If you can imagine, used to be advertised in Canada and across North America very often. It, this was not a big deal. Advertised beer and spirits. It, it was, it, that was part of what we saw in the Canadian culture. But at no point did anyone ever think of the harm to the user or harm to others. It was simply presented as some kind of fun thing to do. 
Uh, but in terms of harm to self and others, the it doesn't it doesn't marry up. It doesn't it doesn't fit the criteria of that second clause that the government should step in and stop people from doing it. The third one is drug use harms users in a different way than other activities. Well, not really. Once again, for two reasons. A, while illicit drugs can worsen users' health, right, even cause death, what about other activities? Smoking, drinking, eating fatty foods, unsafe sex, any of these, these uh, behaviors will also cause harm, irreparable or otherwise, or sometimes even death. So we know that other socially sanctioned forms of behavior are in fact just as harmful, if not worse, than drug use. So the notion that the government should step in and stop us from doing things that harm ourselves <clears throat> becomes even more problematic. The second one is while drug use may damage users' relationships with others and prevent them from developing personal relationships, so do all kinds of other things that are completely legal. Being rude, being arrogant, and ignorant, being selfish, lying. These are all things that are not illegal, but they can poison and make relationships with others highly toxic. So the harm to self, we know that other forms of behavior can harm people just as badly, if not worse. And secondly, harm to others can also be done by just simply being an obnoxious person. Uh, as well, not only those two, but C, right? While drug use may harm or use his financial life, also, guess what? So does gambling. So does dropping out of high school, ending up in a dead-end job. All these things still impact your financial future, your, your financial present as well. Not just drug use, other things as well. And finally, the last one, D, while drug use may damage the user's moral character, we have neither objective evidence nor ways to measure exactly how or if a person's moral character has been corrupted. And now we have, for example, uh, legal use uh, or legalized marijuana use in Canada, and people are looked at as somehow degenerates or deviants of some sort because they happen to smoke marijuana. It used to be that there was a stigma attached to it, and by legalizing it, that stigma has been at least removed. It may be, being, it may be in the back of certain people's minds, but it is, for the most part, been removed. Uh, as a matter of fact, just a quick aside, if you look back to movies, uh, romantic comedies especially over the last, let's say, 20 to 25 years, um, there, there've been, it, there's been drug use presented in many of those films, but not in the way that we look at people as being deviants. Uh, it's simply part of who they are. And there is a kind of social acceptance in the use of recreational marijuana. Sometimes it's done for laughs. Sometimes it's just people do it. But it is introduced into pop culture as something that is somewhat normal. It's what people do. Some people drink wine. Some people smoke a joint. But we now have a different, slightly different view of people that consume marijuana than we did, say, 15 or 20 years ago when there was a stigma attached to it. And of course, it's been that stigma that has been, uh, allowed government agencies to um, to criminalize that kind of behavior. Because if we view those individuals as somehow uh, almost criminal in their intent, it, it's not a far leap to say that you know their behavior is criminal, therefore they are criminals, when clearly that was not the case. So pro prohibitionists, those who wish to uh, criminalize that kind of behavior, Right? They must be outlawed because it harms users' families, uh, friends, co-workers. And once again, we know of other things that people can do that make them just as toxic. Um, yes, to drive under the influence of alcohol is not a good idea, but it is also illegal. Or the use of drugs, also illegal. So let's be clear here. Just because something's been de decriminalized doesn't mean that people can go out and do just about anything. No, absolutely not. The other rules, the other laws are still standing and driving under the influence of whatever it is, is still a criminal offense. So it's still a legal matter, in other words. Now, what if a person does not consume illicit drugs, but they're just rude, obnoxious assholes? They're just horrible people. They're toxic. They're just awful to be around. So is that criminal behavior? Because it certainly is harm to others, right? They're just obnoxious people. And so Anyone that is not empathetic or sympathetic or just, you know, ignores people, that's not criminal behavior, but it certainly has an impact on the relationship that you will have with them and whether or not they are 
you know, they're drinking or taking drugs, they're still acting in a very horrible kind of way. It still harms that person's relationships, uh, relationship with others. So should they be jailed? Well, no, we think not, but it certainly has the same effect. Now, the last part here is uh, the second section I was talking about, the injustice of drug prohibition. And David Husack talks about the criminalization of drug use uh, in his mind is one of the greatest injustices, right? Again, the notion of justice, the notion of fairness. It's uh, an injustice that is as bad as slavery. So those are strong words. If drug use is unjust, then why are half a million Americans unjustly in prison for simply exercising their rights? Uh, if you have control over your body and yourself and your life, your pursuit of happiness, why does the government arbitrarily draw the line here? No, you, you can do this, but you can't do that. You can smoke and drink and be an obnoxious asshole, but you, you can't take drugs. So there's no consistency. That's the problem. It's not really universal law. It's quite the opposite. So uh, why does Husak think that drug use is unjust? Because the state gets to punish people really for no good reason. These individuals know what they're doing. They are exercising their rights. Now, I reserve at this point to just bracket that for a moment and say the fentanyl epidemic that we have, uh, this is of an altogether different nature because we're not talking about criminalizing this kind of behavior. These are uh, incredibly powerful medications that have been given to people, sometimes under the most legal conditions. A doctor prescribes someone uh, fentanyl for a short period of time because of a, a knee injury or a back problem and doesn't consider and think through the fact that this person could become highly addicted to this medication. So here it is. Uh, fentanyl was not always an illegal drug. It was prescribed by doctors legally, and the end result is an absolute epidemic of, of fentanyl use and now the manufacturing of substitutes and polluted versions of it that are sold on the streets. It is an epidemic which warrants its own set of slides, its own module. But I just want to, to put this out because Husak's argument when it comes to fentanyl, it is itself a little bit problematic. But he does say, because it's unjust for a state to punish people without having a good reason to do so, what he's saying is, look, people are exercising their individual rights to use drugs. They know what they're doing. But the reason why I talked about fentanyl is because people really lose very quickly their capacity to to judge properly what they're doing. And they are going down a downward spiral very quickly that we need to intervene at that point to get them back on track. But like I say, that's that's a whole other lesson. So what Husak is talking about here is this, the injustice of drug prohibition, uh, that this right, right, it's neither absolute nor without exception. Um, certain drugs, you know, should be illegal because they are they are incredibly powerful. But overall, when we look at the way in which people behave under the influence, say, of marijuana, uh, very different than, let's say, crack cocaine or bath salts or amphetamines and things like that. The behavior of people should then be some kind of a measuring stick as to whether or not to consider legalizing it or not. And this is, I think, why the government is stepping and moving very slowly and very carefully uh, forward in the decriminalization of certain drugs. Marijuana is something that since I think roughly the 1970s in Canada, uh, attempts have been made to decriminalize it. And we came pretty close under the first Trudeau government in the 70s, and it was put on the back, back burner because it would have been, it would have looked quite odd in the 1980s to legalize uh, marijuana when immediately south of the border was an all out effort, a war on drugs by the Reagan government. It would have looked uh, problematic to say. So the idea of a right to use drugs is derived, to get back on track here, right? The, the idea of the right to use drugs derived from the idea that a person has a right to exercise control over their own body. This is where the pursuit of happiness, pursuit of freedoms of, of one sort or another, uh, this, this is an issue that really boils down to uh, human rights and individual rights, the rights of people to choose what they wish to do. Because remember, people choose to smoke, to drink, to uh, you know, engage in extreme sports, they have a choice. And those that believe that drug prohibition is, is unjust say well, use of marijuana is just the same. It's a choice that people have. It's, it's what they choose to do. 
So let's take a look at what prohibitionists are arguing at this point now if they were to object to the human rights argument. Okay, one would be that drug use does not merely alter the, user, the user's own mind and body. It harms the user's family, friends, and co-workers. Okay, we know again other things can do the same thing. Two, drug use fails to qualify as an exercise of the drug uses right over their body because the individual is essentially an addict. Right? Uh, in the case of fentanyl, a really powerful drug, uh, the individuals lose their sense of proportion, their, their sense of right and wrong, the sense of harm, self-harm. It's gone very quickly. The drug literally ravages their entire body and, and their capacity to think critically. Three, if users are not able to freely choose to use drugs because of an addiction, then it's unjust to punish them for using them at all. Because if the argument of addiction you're not thinking straight, right? Uh, they're not morally or physiologically responsible for their decisions. So it's, it's a difficult issue. It's not one that's easily sort of sold. As I, can, as, as I mentioned, it took over 40 years in Canada alone to decide <clears throat> whether to decriminalize the use of marijuana. That's as far as we've managed to get. Uh, decr decriminalizing other drugs, I don't think I'm going to see that anytime soon. I don't think it's going to happen because uh, if it took 40 years for marijuana, which is probably the most benign of all those drugs, providing it's not laced with anything, we have a far more serious issue with fentanyl use in Canada, in North America. I don't know so much about Western Europe, but certainly in the U.S., essentially North America, we have a major, major social issue that we need to deal with. And I think here the decriminalization of it wouldn't really help because I think it would simply make it more available to people. It is the level of addiction. It is the pervasive use of it and the prescription by doctors that needs to be addressed. And I think just now doctors are finally thinking twice about recommending fentanyl to, to patients simply because of the incredibly difficult situation that those that have used it are now facing. But to get back to conclusions here and what we initially presented, as kind of an example of pushing back against a universal law of government intervention on one hand and human rights and freedoms on the other. If we call ourselves a free, free society, we, can't not, we cannot turn around and lock up people because they happen to use recreationally a drug that we don't agree with, right? That's not a free society. So Michael Humer, that we saw at the beginning, has said most of the arguments in favor of prohibition would be considered feeble if we presented other situations, smoking, drinking, unsafe sex, all these things, being obnoxious and rude to others. Once we introduce those elements into that second clause that says the government should step in, we can see that that position is, is somewhat problematic. So prohibitionists deny that individuals have a legal right to use drugs. Uh, such a response denies either that the person can even control their own body and make up their own mind, or that consuming drugs itself Somehow, it's an exercise of those rights. We need to make sure that when we define human rights, we know what they consist of and not arbitrarily draw a line over certain, uh, certain forms of behavior and not others. So that's essentially the, the argument. So let's take a look at our key points here. Uh, should the recreational use of illicit drugs be prohibited by law? Prohibitionists say yes, because it's harmful. Legalizers say no, because there are some benefits to these drugs. And uh, the argument, as I presented, uh, for prohibitionists, drugs are harmful. Government should prohibit pe people from doing things that are harmful. Therefore, the government should uh, prohibit drug use. But that's wide open. There are many other things that people do that are just as dangerous, but are completely legal. So Michael Humer argues, right, that this the second clause prohibits things that harm individuals. That's the part that's implausible. That's the one that's really tough to maintain when we think about other forms of behavior, which are just as dangerous. And as we saw on the chart, alcohol is the one that's at the very top and by significant degree. So how, how is drug use different from other unsafe and unhealthy practices? Uh, governments should not apply criminal sanctions against these types of behavior because other things are also just as dangerous. Drug use is st statistically less harmful than other activities as I mentioned, alcohol, and three, drug use harms users in a different way than others listed uh, in the activities. So drug use, okay, may make someone, let's say, uh, you know, less productive, 
or the Facebook meme that I laughed at, uh, five, five guys that are drinking will end up in a fight. Five guys smoking dope is going to, are going to start a band. It's, it's productive. So there's maybe that, that issue. Uh, what sorts of harm do drugs cause, right? We know that it can worsen our health, but so do many other things. Smoking, drinking, eating fatty foods, unsafe sex, right? There's another one. Uh, while drug, drugs may damage users' relationships with others, we also know that those things can be done by simply being obnoxious individuals. We will irreparably harm our social relationships if we're just really cantankerous, you know, jackasses. So not illegal, but it will harm your relationships. Uh, to harm a person's financial life, so is gambling, so is so is dropping out of high school, so is, is not having a chance to advance in life. It'll do the same thing, completely legal. And, three, and uh, four here, drug use may damage a person's moral character, but that one's kind of debatable. How do you measure that? How do you, how do you quantify the degree of morality a person has? As I mentioned in my example with uh, romantic comedies over the last 20 years, sort of introducing the notion of smoking marijuana is just something people do rather than cracking open a, open a bottle of wine, for example, it's looked at as, okay, people's moral character maybe isn't as deviated and, and, and degenerate as we once thought they were. And finally, David Husak presents this notion that the state is punishing people for exercising their natural human rights. Why are we locking up people for using uh, marijuana recreationally? It's wrong because the use of drugs derives from the idea that a person has the right to exercise control over their own body. So if that's the case, then people who exercise that right should be allowed to do so. Again, other laws are still in place. You cannot go and smoke a fatty and then get behind the wheel of a car, nor can you down a half a bottle of Jack Daniels and get, and get in your Jeep and drive over to your friend's place. Those are still illegal, but it is the recreational use of that drug that is legal. Other laws are still withstanding. So we need to make sure that that is also understood. Just because it's legal doesn't mean it can be used everywhere. So that's essentially the argument. And pushing back on uh, a universal law, right, uh, against self-harm or harm to others, we can see how that can be very problematic when we talk about drug use and then compare that to other forms of behavior which are just as dangerous to the individual and just as dangerous to relationships with others, uh, as well as financial uh, problems and dangers, and also to the fact that social relationships can be harmed any number of other ways, including just being a horrible person. And that's got nothing to do with drug use. All those other things are still legal. That's essentially it. So those are the two, uh, two halves of module five, A and B, one on the categorical imperative and the other on drug use. So we'll talk to you soon.